Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Kate, welcome back to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast. Great to be back on. Yeah, we've got a very special guest with us today. We've got Kanish from ETF Securities. Um, but before we get to that, we should mention that one of the most popular topics that we have on the show is ETFs and ETF investing. And we've covered ETF 101. We've covered, you know, a beginner's guide to ETFs, if you like. Uh, this time around, we're going to take it to the next step. We're going to talk about something a bit more exciting, a bit more actionable, which is mm. using ETFs to get exposure to something that you're really excited about, whether that's an industry or we'll talk about sectors and thematics and the differences between those. Uh, but Kanish, I thought maybe um, we could just throw it over to you, mate. Just introduce a bit about yourself um, and, your, and your role at ETF Securities. No, thank you, Owen. So, yeah, so my name's obviously Kanish Chug. I'm Head of Distribution for ETF Securities. Now, I guess I've been part of the asset management industry, give or take, um, nearly a decade now, but, you know, really part of the ETF Securities business for five years. And um, essentially my role is to um, look after the sales and marketing, so distribution as we call it, mm -hmm. um, looking at, you know, retail, institutional and the advice area and really covering our, our ETFs, um, which... You know, a lot of people don't know, and I know it was probably covered in, in a previous podcast, but, you know, we're the second oldest in Australia. Um, so, I've been around since 2003, um, but, you know, we're most well known for our gold ETF, physical gold, so G-O-L-D, and more recently, in the past five years, we've tried to sort of broaden out into, you know, different asset classes, you know, looking at equities, um, you know, international, domestic, you know, thematics and sectors, which obviously today we're talking about the thematic area. Mm. Awesome. Yeah, it's, very, it's very exciting. I know Kate, uh, Kate uses ETFs as well as um, mm. managed funds. So um, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be some good action takeaways from this Kate. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I was, I was really excited that we were going to be talking about thematic investing and using ETFs in that way, because once you've learned the basics, um, sometimes you can want to mix it up a little bit and thematic ETFs um, as you'll talk about shortly is a really great way to, invest in some specific areas that you're interested in. And it's definitely been a growing trend at the moment. So I was wondering, Kanish, if you can briefly explain what thematic investing is and how yeah. investors can use ETFs uh, to get exposure to different asset classes and different sectors and industries that are really of interest to them. Yeah, so I think uh, the best way to think about thematic investing is how you would normally approach sector investing. Um, now, the reason why I say that is... Uh, you know, with the evolution of the ETF market, you're now able to target specific themes. Um, previously, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, before ETFs were around in Australia, very limited um, capacity for an investor to say, well, I want to take the theme of um, demographics. I want to take the theme of robotics and automation. You just couldn't do so. Um, mm -hmm. You even probably couldn't do the level of sector investing that you can do now as ETFs have evolved investors now have an ability to really be specific in targeting areas in their portfolios that mean something to them or that they want to take exposure to because they believe that there's a, a growth in that particular area. And so that's really where, why we're seeing thematic investing grow is because of that evolution, I feel, of, of ETFs. Now, to think about thematic investing, you know, I linked it back to sectors. I also want to link it to making sure people understand that when you're talking about thematics in Australia, you're talking about exposures to disruptive long-term megatrends. So that's things like robotics and automation, um, biotechnology, you know, battery technology, um, cyber security, um, even esports to, to a certain extent. You don't have ETFs yet that are what I call a fat ETF. And so that's where we get a lot of questions when talking to um, retail clients, when talking to financial professionals as well, they say, well, I, I like the idea of robotics and automation, but how do I actually allocate to it? Um, because, you know, where do I fit it into my portfolio? 
Mm. And what I say is, well, if this is a thematic that you believe is a long-term disruptive megatrend, well, then it has a place as a satellite in your portfolio in the same way a sector would um, or the same way emerging markets would um, because in a lot of ways emerging markets and thematic investing can be seen along the same line. You know, the idea of the emerging um, new economies such as India, that's a thematic in, in itself. Um, so that's what I would say is make sure when you're looking at thematic investing, look at it with the lens of is this a long-term disruptive megatrend? You know, if you looked at the US ETF market, you'd probably find some short-term, uh, what I call fad ETFs. So make mm -hmm. sure your thematic view is not a fad. And if it is, that's okay. But just if you're taking that short-term, medium-term view, well, then that's what you're doing. You're not taking a long-term view. So an example there was an ETF launched recently because of COVID it was a COVID ETF. <laughs> or there was an ETF in the US launch called WFH, working from home. Now... <laughs> I like the idea, the underlying stocks within that, you know, things like Zoom or Microsoft, you know, really, you know, linking back to the remote work and what we're doing here, the fact that mm. we're going to do this podcast remotely um, mm. with you guys in Melbourne, I'm in Sydney, but it doesn't necessarily for me distinguish, but that's not a long-term thematic. That is a short to medium-term thematic that may not exist in the, in the future. That to me is more of a technology play. Um, so, mm. That, that's what I would say. We don't have those ETFs, by the way, in Australia. We're, we're still very much in the long-term disruptive megatrend area. Um, but just make sure when you think about the Maddox, think about it the same way you do sectors and their satellites. So when, can you on that? So when you're saying like long-term disruptive megatrends, you're, are you talking the like long-term being five to 10 years, possibly longer or? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Poss and possibly longer. Um, so if I was to take robotics and automation and I was to say, well, that actually already impacts my life now. Um, so I've got a little robotics vacuum cleaner. I bought it from Aldi. I didn't buy it from sort of iRobo, but I've got one of those. It sits at home. I use it occasionally and it knows and it's starting to become smarter. It knows the, the messier areas to go, et cetera. But that's the sort of idea that I've already got that in place, but we don't have it completely infiltrating every part of our life. Now, robotics and automation, it's always been around in the manufacturing area for the past 30, 40 years. So we've seen that and we've actually seen an increase because of COVID. There's been this bigger adoption of logistical um, automation and manufacturing automation because there's been restrictions on people um, moving around, etc. But what we haven't seen it is in healthcare. Now COVID's again, accelerated a lot of this, um, or we're now seeing it in the consumer space. Now I said robotic vacuum cleaners, but that's just one of many different areas that you can use artificial intelligence, automation, or robotics. So it's going to be something that's going to be with us for decades to come. So in my view, am I just buying into what is going to be a larger industry down the line? And then that's where I believe that sort of mega trend exists. Mm. And I, it's, uh, oh, sorry, go on, Kate. I, I, th I think it's really important to differentiate between that longer term trend, as you were saying, that five to 10 year time frame and something that you think is exciting right now. And I think yeah. that's often we can get distracted as, as investors um, with the media and the hype of something in the moment versus what could potentially be a really good addition to your portfolio as a long-term thematic trend. Yeah, so I, I think with that, you've got to look at it from two angles. So when I'm creating a portfolio, if I'm you know, talking to advisors and they're looking at a portfolio, they're looking at it with a strategic you know, asset allocation and they're saying, so this is how my core and this is my satellite. And in theory, some of these sectors, some of these thematics could fit into that SAA, that strategic asset allocation view, because they're long-term. Hmm. The more tactical is then how do I overweight this? So do I go, yes, I already believe that technology or I already believe that robotics is going to have a place. So it's going to be featuring in my portfolio. But right now, I may believe that actually it's got greater growth because of COVID. So then I tactically allocate more to it. And that's what you may see. But in that same line of tactical is where you may see is you, you talked about those short-term themes or those short-term, I call it, you know, what is it thematic? Is it, a, is it a fad? Is it a trend? So if it's what I would call a fad, which is not to, you know, have a negative view on it, but it's short-term. Um, mm. short to medium term therefore it's going to be more tactical you need to know that there's probably higher volatility within that as well um, and I guess on even the thematics there's a sense of high volatility versus just buying the market um, because these are 
disruption, you know, disruptive forces in industry. So there's going to be periods in which they succeed. There's going to be periods in which they do not so well. They have that volatility inherent with them. So you're taking a long-term view because if I take a, a one-month view, well, then I'll pretty much sell out everything and I won't, I won't look at it ever again. <laughs> I need to take a five, five-year view with that. It's, I should have said at the top of the show, Kanish, um, we've been working with your team to get a, a white paper on this as well. So a report that people can access for free. Um, it'll be available in the show notes when this goes live. But if what Kanish is saying, if you're trying to think about how that, you know, how you might be able to implement some of these ideas that you have using ETFs, you, you can see the link in the show notes. I'd encourage you to go check that out. It's a free report. Um, it's written by the guys at ETF Security. So please check that out. Um, we've actually received a lot of questions in anticipation of this episode, Kanish, because so many people and many, many thousands of our listeners uh, listening to this right now will be thinking, you know, I invest in ETFs. I've got some ideas around this, but I've also got some questions. Yeah. So I was hoping just to throw uh, three of them over to you. Yeah, sure. um, they're, they're not too, not too bad. Um, they're pretty easy. So I hope you can uh, fill us in on these. So the first one, and I'll quote, it goes, Hey, I'm wondering if it's possible for Kanish to explain how ETFs with over a thousand holdings and with holdings spread all over the world actually operate. Also, how are the fund providers of ETFs able to keep fees so low? That's the question. Yeah, so I guess two, two things there. So um, generally for all of our ETFs that we run on the equity side, we phys physically replicate, so we fully replicate those underlying indexes. So I guess breaking it back down, an ETF, when you're talking about passive, it's essentially tracking a benchmark. Mm. So if we're talking about equity ETFs, it's tracking an equity index. Now, we as the fund managers, we don't profess to know which stock we should buy. We outsource that and we license those indexes. So an example there is our Robo ETF. We license that index from Robo Global. They're the experts in that space and they're the ones that are able to identify the 90 near stocks that are, you know, part of this theme of robotics automation and artificial intelligence. So we license the index off them. Now within those 90 stocks, we fully replicate that. So we hold all 90 stocks within our portfolio. Now, if for example, we were licensing an index that had 2000 names and there are ETFs out there that have indexes that have more than you know, thousands of names in them, it's very difficult to actually hold 2,000 names within a within an ETF. So they do, do what's called index sampling. And that's where the index, the ETF providers, you know, they appropriate and they work out, okay, well, what's the best sample of that index that gives the closest reflection of the underlying index in terms of performance? Now, they're experts in this, and that's what we would do in that case. You know, we would want to make sure essentially that the tracking difference between the ETF's performance and the index performance is minimal. You know, essentially you want the tracking difference for the majority of cases to be just the fee that, mm -hmm. that we charge. You don't want it to be any more than that. It can be for certain, um, certain ETFs and there's reasons for that. But that's essentially what it would be, it'd be a sample of the underlying index because it's physically and operationally and cost, you know, from an efficient perspective, just not possible to hold three, 4,000 names um, within an ETF. So it's easier for the providers to simply do a sample. So that. Kanish, just on that, so let's just hypothetically, just to it really hits home with people, mm. if there are 2,000 companies that are in this uh, index, if, you, if, a, if a provider is uh, sampling, they might own 500 or something more manageable. Yes. And then they get as close as they can to where it's efficient for them to get a very accurate, I guess, like for like performance with that. Yeah, exactly right. 2000 yeah. market. Yep. It, exactly right. And they would physically hold, uh, well, for, for those that are physically holding um, the, the underlying stock, they would physically hold those X number of the 2000, for example. Um, as I said, from where we sit as ETF screens, we don't do that. Um, none mm -hmm. of our indexes are large enough where we need to do any sampling. We can physically replicate um, each of our um, uh, indexes on the equity side that we have to. So, you know, we're, we're sort of fortunate in that position at the moment, but not so that we won't need to do any index sampling in the future. Because mm -hmm. there are some pretty big ETFs overseas that sort of invest in all of the countries. So it must be quite challenging to do that. Yeah. And I think just on the cost you, you were asking, you know, how, do we, how do you keep the cost down? So mm. if you think of a active manager, 
now, um, you know, my previous background was in active funds management. So I've sort of come from that side and you know that in the active managed, you know, funds, they're paying, you know, quite high um, staffing costs to analysts, to portfolio managers. And because that's their role to research stocks and make decisions about, you know, let's think about a, a large cap Australian equity um, managed fund. You know, it's, they're going to make a decision. Do I buy CB Commonwealth Bank today? Do I sell ANZ tomorrow? How much do I hold of BHB, et cetera, et cetera. As an ETF, as an ETF provider, our role is purely to track the index. So we're not actively saying within our ETF, you know, take our FANG ETF. We're not saying, well, we should sell Facebook and buy Amazon and we should double the weight of Netflix. No, all we're doing is if the index says this, we track the index and every quarter. And that's the beauty of a passive ETF is that the rules around the indexes, it's all visible. You know, investors can jump onto our website, for example, and actually see the holdings of our equity products. Even on our gold and you know, metal products, they can see the exact number of bars, the weights, the serial numbers of each bar. That tells us, you know, that our gold fund has 25 tons of, of gold. You can you can get to the level of how many bars are in there. So, so the transparency is there um, at the index level. They know when those rules are going to be applied. They know what those rules are. There's no sort of secret sauce as such. Um, you know, and that's why you can charge a lot less than what you may have to do if you're an active fund that wants to keep that IP in house. Mm, absolutely. And I think that transparency has really been a game changer and made mm. ETFs really popular. And that kind of leads into the next question uh, from one of our listeners that had a question in regards to ETFs and how everyone usually talks about how good they are. And we probably mm. do do talk yep. about them quite a lot. But he was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about some of the negative sides of ETFs, aside from some of the basic risks like management fees, uh, finding a reputable provider, which is something we've mentioned before. So what are some of those other potential negatives that you need to consider with ETFs that are maybe not talked about as much? Yeah, so obviously there are a lot of positives, um, but there are some risks that people need to be um, aware of. So an example there is if I've built a portfolio of just ETFs and, you know, say it was, let's call it 15 ETFs because I've got enough um you know, money that I can do that across 15. And I decide mm -hmm. that every quarter I'm going to rebalance that portfolio back to my original weights. Well, that essentially means you're doing 15 trades or potentially more of selling down and buying more, et cetera. Now that transactional cost can build. So, you know, ETFs can be good, but it depends on how frequently, how much of your portfolio is made up of ETFs how much transactional costs are you willing to bear to be able to manage that? So how frequently do you rebalance? So that's one I would say. Um, and so sometimes when we're talking to a lot of clients, they say, well, an ETF is just for a low cost portfolio. Yes. For some of some ETFs, you can build a very low cost portfolio around it, but then you wouldn't have 15 ETFs in that. You'd have a, a smaller number just mm -hmm. to make sure you don't have the transactional costs is basically eating away into your capital. Um, the second part of that as well would be don't take, uh, I call it, you know, two e the, there is no ETF that is a twin. And what I mean by that is we've got a lot of ETFs now in Australia. There's nearly over 210 um, available covering active, passive, asset classes, international, domestic, a whole range. So you want to make sure when you're looking at an ETF, you actually analyze beyond the name of the ETF. You analyze beyond the index as well because it may you may perceive it to be or assume it to be something else mm. so you know i use the example of um, european equities now i think there's four or five european equity etfs in the market you know we have one um ours is sort of the euro stocks 50 index it's 50 from just the eurozone it's 35 basis points it's unhedged and it's quarterly distribution in terms of any dividends that are paid but there is an ETF that is 350 stocks and that is 60 basis points in terms of its fee. And that includes UK and Europe. There's an ETF that is hedged. Um, that is an ETF that is, you know, a few hundred stocks that is again, broad Europe. So if you just talk X name Europe equity ETF, well then I'm just going to assume they're all going to be similar, um, but they're not. So mm -hmm. look beyond the name. Um, and as we're going to start to see more and more ETFs being launched, and, you know, right now, from where we stand as ETF securities, you know, we want to try and find gaps in the market, try to be a bit more, you know, intelligent and, and try to bring out an alternative to something that maybe 
already done in the market, but be a bit smarter about it. Um, what I would say is you're going to find, you know, ETFs that are of the same region, the same asset class. Um, just be aware of what are the differences. And it could be as simple as the distribution frequency. So if clients that are really wanting income, they may want an ETF that has pays more frequently versus one that is annual, for example. But, you know, all the fees slightly different. But why is that? Yeah, and you often have to look a bit further in the fine print to find those differences and because they can look quite similar on the outset. Yeah, they can. So we do a bit of work around that. So we built, um, we produce an ETF landscape. So it's at the moment, every quarter, it may be every six months that we start to push it out to, but it's a booklet that profiles every ETF in the market. Um, so it's not just our 16 ETFs, it's, it's everyone, or 18 ETFs, it's everyone else's as well. Um, and we saw it as a value add. You know, as I mentioned, we're not going to have every product under the sun in our business. Um, well, not yet anyway. So for us, we want to make sure that our clients and investors just understand the differences between what is available to them. Um, and if they still make that decision to go for another product, then that's fine. But as long as they're doing it with the best informed and, and the best information possible. So, yeah, that's about to get actually released in the next few weeks as well. Great. Awesome. And we had one more big question, so save the best for last. Uh, in the case of thematic ETFs, for example, Robo, Tech, Cure, ACDC, how likely are these products to track those specific themes or industries over time? And they even added an example. For example, if I bought Robo and over the next decade, robotics and automation became a massive growth industry, how confident are you, I'm presuming as ETF securities, yeah. that the underlying index, um, which in this case, the Robo Global Robotics and Automation Index, would incorporate up and coming companies and really capture the uh, upswing in growth? Um, and what is the likelihood that the index could miss out on some of these up and coming companies and underperform the industry as a whole? A bit question. of a mouthful. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess there's two points. That one, it's um, as a provider, it's our responsibility, um, really, to make sure that we choose the right index. So in that product development process, when we are identifying we want to target this thematic of robotics and automation, artificial intelligence, you know, there was a few different index choices that we had available. Um, we chose RoboGlobal in this case because we felt it was the best representation to target this theme. It was mm -hmm. one that you know, we talked about active and having analysts, et cetera. The actual Robo Global Index has a team of analysts. They have a research team underlying that create this universe mm -hmm. and identify these different themes. You know, they actually rely upon, a, a, I think it's about 10 or 15 Robo strategic advisors. And these advisors are people like, you know, Daniela Roos, who basically heads up the robotics area at MIT, um, or the founder of the Kiva system. And the Kiva system is what is now Amazon Robotics. Um, so that's Rafael D'Andrea. Um, so he's now, I think, part of a, a think tank out in Europe. And, you know, he's producing, you know, robots that can play table tennis with each other. But these people are at the cutting edge of essentially this area. And they're identifying and feeding back into the analysts and the research team for Robo Global. What is the next area that needs to be considered? Or say within 3D printing, they should be looking at not retail 3D printing, but commercial 3D printing, because that is where the most developments are being made in terms of that the automation side or artificial intelligence side. So they're able to leverage that expertise. So for us, it was a case of, well, we don't want to just pick up something off the shelf. That's not going to do it in, in this case because that could mean that we identify a, you know, there is an index that, that is available where you may find that it's not actually robotics and automation where they generate most of their revenue. It could, you know, you find a company in there that generates a lot of revenue from selling something else. It's nothing related to robotics and automation, but because somewhere they're classified as this sector of robotics and automation, well, then they're featuring in there. So really important when we're doing the due diligence that we're looking for appropriate index providers to make sure that we find that they reflect the underlying theme or sector that we want. And I think the second part is a constant sort of, I guess, you know, analysis and, you know, just making sure that that index is doing what it's supposed to do. And mm -hmm. so an example there, ACDC, which um, you know, is our battery technology and lithium mining ETF. It looks at this whole idea of battery storage. 
um, it uses in there, one of its databases it was using was a US Department of Energy database for storage solutions. Um, now, that database ended up, you know, not being updated by the US government because they stopped funding for it. And so the index provider for that particular ETF is Sol Active. They identify that that's a weakness. You know, we're trying to target this theme of battery technology, but we're doing it potentially with what's a database that's not being updated on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So they changed that database to a company called Clean Horizon. And they specifically are looking at the idea of clean energy solutions. And so that for us was a great advocation that, look, we can look at that, we can monitor this, the index providers are making sure that that product and that index is tracking what it's supposed to be doing. Um, and if it's not, well, then it's on us to make sure that either we change the index to one that can do, or we work with the index managers to identify what can be done, which is what happened with that ACDC ETF. So yes, there is a risk. And that's why I would say again, understand who is the index manager behind it, understand who are the providers behind it, find someone reputable and find someone that's actually making, you know, keeping an eye on this. Otherwise you could end up with an ETF where you're supposed to get robotics and automation and you just get normal technology, which you may get from a tech ETF, which is fine, but that's what you're, you're essentially doing. Mm. Mm. I think you, I think you touched on two points here, which are really important. One is just making sure that you as an investor, you're looking at these things and you're making sure that you're getting the best expression of the idea that you have. So that's the way yes. I frame it, like an expression. Yes. So if you, if you want your portfolio to reflect robotics and automation, take a look at what's inside the portfolio to make sure that that is the right expression for you. And then also it's important to look at those holdings because it, keep, it helps the investors keep tabs on, you know, who's, who's actually running this thing and how often are they updating it and are the companies relevant and all those types of questions. I think that's a really good way that you frame it. And I think not a lot of people can actually, at least in, from retail investors, mum and dad investors, not, not many of them actually go that extra length and, and actually look at the portfolio holdings and then go and read about those companies. Yeah, and I think the other part is, look, um, you know, in, when I think about thematic investing, I personally will say, it's my personal view, invest in what you are interested in. You know, invest in what you feel is going to make a difference, especially when you're talking about sectors or themes or emerging markets, et cetera. So, you know, if I'm thinking I really am interested in the idea of robotics and automation, or I really believe in the idea of biotechnology, well, then I can target those specific areas within my portfolio. It's of interest to me. But they're satellite exposures because we mentioned before, they've got a little bit of inherent volatility in them. Um, they're long term. Um, so, you know, they are complement to what you already have in your portfolio as your core. Mm -hmm. um, also, I'm looking at an ETF over a single stock because I have no idea whether I should buy, you know, whether it's a um, Daifuku, which is a logistical automation company out of Japan or, you know, Yaskawa or whatever it may be. You know, some of these names I had never heard of until, you know, we had the Robo ETF. Mm -hmm. um, or even when I was looking at the um, ACDC ETF or the biotech is a really interesting one because I don't know in that biotech ETF, if I looked at what was the best performer last year, a single stock level and how they've done this year, it's very different. Mm -hmm. um, so I had no idea which ones to pick. So do I pick the winners or losers? And we were talking with one of the index managers and they were saying, when I'm buying a theme or I'm buying a sector, I don't want to buy the winner or loser. I want to buy the theme in the sector, which is why they prefer to go down the path of having an index versus having a single stock. Mm. Purely the reason, because at least I've got the entire area. It's of interest to me. I've got it. I don't need to consider and do any more research. But if you do, well, then you can complement that and buy the single stock or buy a managed fund or an active manager that you believe has that overweight because you've got that cost now efficiency where you're doing a little bit cheaper via the ETF and you can take on that bit more risk if it's a single um, stock or a manager. Mm. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Kinish, this um, brings us to the end of the conversation, but I just want to say uh, thanks for taking the time out and breaking down thematic investing and ETFs in general to make it so easy for us to digest. I think these things can have a tendency to get quite complicated. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, thanks for taking the time out. No, no, thanks for having me. And um, we'll we'll have a, the full white paper available in the show notes, Kate. So yeah. um, we'll be able to to direct people to that. If if you've got you know ten or fifteen minutes, go and have a look at it. We'll give you some great ideas on and the ways that you can implement some of these strategies in, in your portfolio. 
Kate, as always, thanks for taking the time to join me on the show. Thanks for listening.